Great. Hello, my name is Sarah Wack and I'm a student at the University of Buffalo and a summer education intern with the Jacobs Institute. I'm excited to welcome you to our final session of the Jacob Institute's high school webinar series. The Jacobs Institute is a medical innovation center located in the Buffalo Niagara Medical Campus and sponsors collaboration between clinicians, researchers, engineers, and entrepreneurs to develop medical devices. Over the course of the four webinars, our host, Dr. Ken Snyder, has discussed the innovations that have changed medical practice and the current treatments. Dr. Snyder is a dual trained neurosurgeon and a part of the University of Buffalo's neurosurgery department. His additional training and specializations has helped given him the necessary tool set for specialization in the comprehensive management of neurovascular pathology in both the brain and spinal cord, including treatment of aneurysms and stroke. Also joining our final session today is Dr. Thomas Hughes, who will continue to offer his expertise on COVID-19. Dr. Hughes is the Chief Medical Officer of the Ottoman Physician Alliance, a collection of 600 physicians across Western New York who work in concert with Kaleida Health to improve the quality of care in the region. Prior to that position, Dr. Hughes was a family physician in solo practice for about 20 years. The Jacob Institute's high school representatives, Janat and Josh, are also joining today's final session. Janat is a rising junior at Public School 197, Math, Science, Technology Preparatory School, and Josh is a rising senior at St. Joseph's Collegiate Institute. Over the past three sessions, we have discussed various topics, including aneurysms, AVM, stroke, and COVID-19. With visual aids, including live surgery clippings, MRIs, and CAT scans, we have learned more about what these medical injuries are and how they are treated. We've seen how current treatments can be challenged and improved. We've come to understand the efficiency that comes from collaboration across disciplines. And among one of the most important lessons, we have learned to recognize the importance of the why behind our own personal passion. And this encourages us to question and critically think about that favorite topic as we start our own journeys of exploration regarding it. Today's session will continue to break down what science has uncovered about the intricacies of COVID-19 as Dr. Snyder and Dr. Hughes continues the discussion. At the conclusion of today's webinar, a link to a survey monkey will appear. And if you missed the opportunity, the link will also be included in the automated email from Zoom that will be sent to participants tomorrow. Please complete the survey as the responses will continue to help us improve the experience for future webinars. Questions and comments are always encouraged. Please type any questions you may have in the chat box on Zoom during today's webinar. Questions will be raised when relevant during lecture or answered during the Q&A section scheduled in today's program. Please keep all questions and comments appropriate and respectful. Attendees are still welcome to join the Slack platform if they wish to connect with other attendees outside the webinar. This platform provides a space where the discussions can continue and help foster a community of shared interests. Attendees have the opportunity to opt into the Slack discussion by leaving their name and email in the post-webinar survey monkey that will be available at the conclusion of today's webinar. As a friendly reminder, participants will have the opportunity for their names to be drawn to attend a smaller Zoom meeting with Dr. Snyder at a later date. All participants who have attended at least three of the four sessions at the conclusion of the series will be automatically entered into the drawing and if chosen will be contacted via email. Without further ado, I present our wonderful host, Dr. Ken Snyder, and our special guest, Dr. Thomas Hughes. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, panelists. Um, thank you to everybody on the webinar for, for taking another hour of, um, out of their day to spend time with us on a beautiful summer day. Um, I appreciate all the responses um, from each of the webinars. Um, I will alter some of the content based on them. I may take for granted um, what I'm able to see or be blessed and lucky enough to see each day from a surgical perspective. And there's a lot of interest in seeing those surgical videos. So we'll probably take about the first 20 minutes and just go through some really unique anatomy and unique cases. Um, the ideas or questions that came up on pediatric neurosurgery, just know that each of you, as I mentioned in the first episode, um, when you become part of the JI family, your family, we, we share an interest in uh, your success and we want to foster and build the relationships to get your questions answered. So I'm happy to connect you with our pediatric neurosurgeons and try and set up some shadowing. The goal is for you to have access to learn about things that interest you um, and we'll follow up on each and every one of those. Um, I want to specifically take time to thank each of the panelists because I, you know how if I go off on a tangent, I'll, I'll stay on that tangent the whole time time. Um, Sarah, as an intern, you have been exceptional. I appreciate your ability to organize this for everyone and follow up, and I really look forward to working with you in the future, and thank you. I'm glad the panelists get an appreciation of the exceptional 
um, uh, guidance, wisdom, uh, skill set of Dr. Tom Hughes. Um, he makes me a better person working with, and I'm, I'm glad you all get to see that and appreciate it. And that really bore itself out in the comments. Um, uh, Josh and Jeanette, thank you again for the continued help. I'd love to, if we were in a small group session, I'd be forcing a lot more out of you. I know we're taking up a lot of the conversation, but again, as panelists, the more you can interrupt, the more you can engage and ask the questions, the better. And I thank you guys for being on the stage and being kind of a reference for the group. Um, Tom, any comments or we'll jump right in? No, I think you guys have put together a spectacular team. You should be incredibly proud of what, what you've done. I was, uh, I, I was uh, bragging for you to some other people the other day. And I, I think this is the model of education going, going forward. Um, you know, I was excited to note that this is my third to four, so I'm eligible for the, uh, the small group session contest. I'm hoping for the best on that. Um, but I, I, I think that the ability to bring diverse communities together, you know, none of us are in the same room at the moment. Uh, and to have real conversations is formative, not just for education, but how we, how we are going to care, care for patients, care for each other moving forward. Thanks. So thank you. Pam Marcucci, JI team, thank you very much. I'm starting with a different theme today, but it's a theme that I fell for every stage of my life. I fell for this through high school. I fell for it in college. I fell for it in medical school. I fell for it in residency. At every point in the stage of my career, somebody said, don't worry, just get through it. Everything's gonna get easier. They lied to me through every single time it was a lie. Nothing gets easier. Recognize it right now. And the reason for recognizing it and the reason I wish I knew it then was it's transformative for you to tell yourself, if I can't find balance now, I will never find balance. I don't care what stage you're in, all of you, for you to have taken an hour out of a summer day to spend time, you're gonna all work like crazy for your lives. That's a wonderful and meaningful and fulfilling experience. You have to learn now how to balance, how to balance family, how to balance your health, how to balance other ideas and other things to learn about. It is really important to be able to hyper-focus and have that gear and have that throttle, but don't think I'm gonna get through this hump and then everything is going to get easier. Um, Tom always helps me and has helped me as we've gone through this COVID of balancing this level of perspective, but of all the sentences I wish I had heard or realized back in high school, this is the most important one from my perspective. Tom, any comments? I, I, I couldn't agree more. I was, there's the old expression with the, the Navy SEALs use, the only easy day was yesterday. Um, and, and I think it's true, but, it, but it's also a challenge to focus how you're working hard. Uh, you can work medium hard at meaningless worse work and it sucks the life out of you. You can work 16, 18, 20 hours a day at work that matters and that that leaves you recharged. It gives you gives you more energy. Uh, I you know I think anyone who watches presentation, listen to the passion with which you describe your procedures, knows how how, how that work makes you feel. And so no, it, it, the days don't get shorter. Uh, the 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 work doesn't get easier. Uh, and, and quite honestly, if if you ever come to a point in your life where you think, gosh, this is really getting easy. Th th that's when you have to look in the mirror. Are you challenging yourself enough? Are you pushing yourself enough? Uh, because it should be getting harder. You should be getting better and faster at, at what, you, what you did. But if you, if you make the right choices, you're gonna find yourself down a pathway wh where that work gives you passion. And, and in incredibly long days uh, are gonna give you meaning ra ra rather than, than sucking you dry. Thanks, Tom. I'm gonna transition to some, um, there's been a lot of questions on cancer and I feel bad I haven't been able to cover a ton of cancer. I'm gonna show um, a cancer surgery next. The concepts around cancer are, there's lots of checkpoints within cells such that when a cell divides or grows, it feels its neighbor next to it. And it's a kind of mechanoelectrical transduction of touch that cells have. And it reminds them um, to 
continue to work as a factory, but you don't need to grow anymore. We don't need to continue dividing. And there's something about the touch and interaction of cells that ceases that. At some point within cancer development, um, that goes wrong. And cells begin to overgrow in crowded regions or crowded areas. The, the inhibition of touch is no longer present. And these cells have been programmed to grow various things depending on their stage. They could be growing kidney, they could be growing a lung, they could be trying to grow a brain, okay? And what happens is, is they will continue to try and grow that anywhere that they are on the body. If they're able to hitchhike onto a blood, into the bloodstream and go somewhere and get, dis, get lodged into those capillaries, those small fine capillaries where we talked about the streams, guess what they try and do over here? They try and grow whatever original organ they were growing in. And so when you think about cancer, there's really two ways to think about it. There's cancers that push on other structures because they are not from that original structure. Let's call this the brain. Let's call this the lung. When a cancer from the lung goes to the brain, it is a pushing type of cancer. It squeezes the brain as it tries to make a lung. The other type of cancer is a eating type of cancer. It, it goes through the various structure. And this often happens when the cancer comes from the organ itself. When the brain tissue becomes cancerous, it grows in a stellate fashion. It grows through all of the nerve and glial fibers that are there, and it becomes very spider web integrated. You don't have a capsule or an egg that sits there that demarcates the tissue. Does that make sense? And in any organ system you're dealing with, that's often what you're thinking about when you're thinking about how am I gonna deal with this from cancer? And the interesting thing when you think about cancer is you don't necessarily think about curing it with one modality. It's how can I remove the bulk of this tumor safely with surgery? How can I get the rest of it with radiation therapy? What little bit could I leave left with hormonal therapy? And then how do I boost up the immune system to make sure that it deals with any little cells that are left? Those are the concepts that take place um, as you approach cancer in any organ that you're approaching it in. The reason I chose starting this video was this is a, a covering of the brain tumor called the meningioma. The meninges cover the brain. So this is a pushing tumor. This is not coming from the substance of the brain. And this happens to be the same exact approach we use to clip the ICA terminus aneurysm. Here's the frontal lobe, here's the temporal lobe. The tumor has already started to split the two lobes apart for us because it's a pushing tumor. It grows not into and through brain, it grows in the spaces of the brain. So this is actually the same exact approach we used. Now remember when we used the approach to clip the aneurysm, there were two really important structures the nerve to the eyes, the optic nerves and the cross, and then right below that was the carotid artery. The challenge with tumor surgery is you don't know where those are relative to the tumor. We're gonna be digging down through a tumor knowing that at its base is the nerve and the carotid. You don't wanna hit those. So how do you safely debulk and stop the blood supply to a tumor that might be encasing structures around it. And so that's what I'll show you. So here, same arachnoid dissection that we made around the, um, the original aneurysm surgery. This time we're using an ultrasound that basically at high speed is mechanically breaking up the fibrous connections of this covering or meningioma. We're not as, we're, there's always bleeding with tumors. So you see right there, what's that white structure? That's the optic nerve. We had seen it before, but we had to debulk the tumor and push the tumor out of the way to find it. We want to identify that early in the surgery so we can protect it and then come back and work on the rest of the tumor. The tumor's coming from the roof of the eye or the orbital dura right here, and that's where it's growing from. So we'll continue to now protect it. The red structure right next to the nerve is the carotid artery, as we saw earlier. So once you've got those structures, you literally 
protect the brain and chop out this tumor. It's a pushing tumor. We're lucky in that the brain itself can be protected and all we need to do is safely remove as much of this thing as possible. Those yellow structures are bipolars. You burn between the two ends. Everything else here are either suctions, scissors, or that ultrasound device. And you can see this tumor actually wedged itself down between the two nerves. Do you see what I mean by it's not a infiltrative eating tumor? You can pull it from the normal structures. You can make a plane around it and pull out what's trying to grow. That's consistent anywhere um, that, that cancer grows, as long as it's not infiltrative. And so what's left is the beautiful anatomy that the, that the tumor has laid out for you. Because remember, it pushes on everything else. So what used to be a hard corridor to dissect the frontal lobe off the temporal lobe, guess what? The tumor did all that work for you. You're looking right at the carotid artery, the PCOM and um, uh, the anterior choroidal, the middle cerebral and the anterior cerebral, right here splayed out before your eyes, which is just beautiful, beautiful anatomy. Um, so that's a tumor surgery. This next surgery um, is one of our most intricate surgeries. It's called a bypass. So what you're looking at here is this is the back of the spinal cord. What you're looking at here are the cerebellum or the back of the head. So we're working in the back. This is where the spinal brain stem comes down to spinal cord. These are called the pica uh, blood vessels. They're less than one millimeter in size. So these are sub one millimeter blood vessels. There's an aneurysm coming up leading to this that's gonna require us to sacrifice the blood vessel proximal. The only way the distal part of the brain gets blood is if I block this, the other side has gotta come in and fill it and then send blood along both pathways. So this is called a side-to-side -side anastomosis. And so as we're watching this, we first clip off the area that we're gonna cut the blood vessels open and sew them together. So the first thing I'm gonna tell you is this. Anybody that thinks that this is a piece of cake is lost their mind. This is one millimeter blood vessel to one millimeter blood vessel. It literally is the, the suturing is blind to your eye. If you drop the needle, you can't find it. It's only visible under 50X optics of work. So as you can see, as we're working, you're gonna see my, the hand shaking, okay? There are techniques and methods that anyone can learn to keep your hands from shaking. It involves keeping all your joints in flexion, not in extension. That includes from the neck to the elbows and down. It involves making sure your hands are well rested on the skull or on the other areas so you could do this work. And then you do as fine of a work as you can with zero or as little tension as you can. But under this level of precision, we all shake. There's hardly any way not to. But it's a learned technique of learning how to minimize that ability of shake. And by doing the repetition of it over and over, you really can, people that think, oh, I could never do it, you can do it. It just takes 100 hours plus of practice. And it takes understanding how to position your hands so that your natural tendency to shake doesn't get in the way. When people tell me, oh, I could never be a surgeon, I shake too much, the vast majority of us have to realize we all do. There are techniques we learn to be able to do this level of precision. And so basically we make a one little nick in each blood vessel and sew both ends of those loops together. Once they're sewn together, we take the temporary clips off and we do what we did for the other aneurysm surgery, which is put dye inside the blood vessels and visualize under fluorescence, does everything connect? What you'll see is that once we know we've established blood supply and good flow through this, we then clip off the proximal end of one of the entry zones to prove that we've got good flow because that's about to happen when we clip off the aneurysm. And again, why would we do it? It means there's no safe way of treating the aneurysm other than physically clipping off the segment inflow and outflow to ensure that it doesn't rupture or give us a problem. And so now you'll see we'll shut down one of the entry segments from the vertin a little bit 
and we're just ensuring that there's good blood supply from the other side. Um, but these are fairly intricate technical surgeries and sometimes um, you can thrombose these off and not get good blood supply. You've got to get it right at the time of the surgery. Um, there's no second chance at that one, okay? Um, this one I'm going to show you is a scary surgery. It was from my specialty training I got at the Barrow Institute um, in Phoenix, Arizona, with probably the leading expert in this type of surgery. We used to say if you have a tumor in your brainstem, there's nothing you can do about it. Your brainstem has all the cabling from the brain going down through it, carrying it out to the rest of the body. And it's also where the cranial nerves come off that go to your face. So basically, if you damage a uh, part of your brainstem, you've allowed your brain to continue to work at high level, but you get no throughput down to the rest of your body. So you're locked into your body. You can't move, there's no sensory, you can't blink, you can't do anything. So this is high real estate structure. Well, what Dr. Spetzler realized or learned is that there is a connection to where the cerebellum comes into the back of the brainstem that gives you a safe corridor through all of those nerves that are there. And so you actually go transcerebellar into the back of the brainstem. The scary part is you're covering a ton of tissue distance before you're in the back of a really important structure and you are 100% blind to where you're going. You are, you are reliant on navigation. What do I mean by that? We put these markers on somebody's head and we actually fuse their MRI into their head. And while I work, I move my tools through their MRI to give me the trajectories and angles of where I'm working. So let's just say there's no room for error for the, for the alignment of the MRI on somebody's brain. So in this case, we make a little window of bone behind the ear, and you're gonna see us go right through the cerebellum down into the brainstem and pull out a tumor. So here's the window of bone. This is the dura. The dura gets opened in a little triangle. It's only about the size of two finger breaths. We then cut the arachnoid and using navigation, pick a spot in the cerebellum that we know will get us to this tumor. So we're gonna go right through cerebellum into the back of the brainstem to take out a tumor. You are 100% dependent at this point on the navigation, giving you the trajectory to where you're going. So now this, this incision is only about five millimeters in size. Very, very, very small incision. When we see bleeding like that, that actually calms me down. That's not high pressure arterial bleeding of something pumping out to the ceiling. That's a low pressure bleed. When I see that, that usually means I'm at the tumor. I'm in the right spot. I actually calm down because if I didn't see that, I'd say, where am I? There's a problem. So that tells me, great, I just reached the tumor interface. Let that little bit of blood ooze out. And now, again, pushing tumors. Pushing tumors mean you can develop a plane around normal, healthy sponge of brain tissue and the abnormal stuff growing in the middle. Can I get a plane around this thing to pull it out? It's not densely adherent because it's not coming from the structure itself. If it came originally really from an invasive brain, you can't take them out this way. They're too glued in. You could never grab a piece of it and pull it. The entire brain substance would come with it. Does that make sense? So, so here we're working on dissecting around it, grabbing at this abnormal tumor construct, and then actually pulling it out through a one centimeter or less area. This is coming from the middle of the brainstem, this tumor. But again, I want you to see, especially in a few more, you take out some chunks of it, but wait, you see how much tumor we're able to remove and resect from this very minimal approach, as long as you come at it at the exactly right angle and right plane, right? And literally now we're looking at the cavity within the brainstem, just making sure that there isn't any tumor left. And then we'll inject this little substance that helps it stop any bleeding in that area and surgery's done. Um, this, I, I've always want, I want, I promised I'd show you guys spinal cord. I love, the nerve roots of the spinal cord and seeing them. It's just so obvious to me of how things work. 
meaning you take a motor nerve from the leg and it goes down and connects and you electrically stimulate it and guess what happens? That part of the leg jumps. And the, the sensory element comes up to the spinal cord as well as a separate nerve and you just stimulate that, you get a sensory signal. It's very easy in a one-to-one -one understanding of how the, the, the nerve fibers work once they come off of the spinal cord. You've got one motor, you've got one sensory. One thing that's interesting is the spinal cord ends about midway down the back. This is a side view. These are the bones and these are the discs in the lumbar spine. This is the sac where the spinal uh, nerve roots come down and then they leave these areas and go down to different parts of the body. And we call this area cauda quina because it looks like the tail of a horse because the end of the spinal cord's here and all that's left are all these little nerve fibers. Now the problem is you don't know which ones go where. You don't know which one goes to the upper thigh, which one goes to the sacral area, which one goes to the bottom of the foot, which one's a motor fiber, which one's a sensory fiber. You have no idea, okay? And in looking at this, this person presented with back pain, but they have this weird circle sitting right there in their spine. And when we look through the circle, we look at the axial cut, which is a look through here, here's the bone, and we see this weird thing in the middle of the, spine, uh, the lumbar sac. What should it look like? Do you see how if you look here, you've got all these little dots? Those are the cross sections of all the tails of the horse going down. And you see on the section above that, you see nothing like that. Where the heck are all the tails? All the nerves are pushed off to the side from something. So something's going on down there. Something's growing in that region. And that's when surgeons get involved. So what did we do? We went down and we explored this area. You take the back of the bones off the spinal sac in the lumbar. And so what are we looking at? This is the spinal dura. Just like there's a hard covering of the brain that keeps spinal fluid in, there's a hard covering of the spinal sac. In fact, they're connected to one another. And so we think that there's something going on in that sac. So you can put an ultrasound down to find it. And then what do you do? Open up the sac. So then we open up the dura and here's the tails of the horse. These are all the nerve roots going down to the leg. And you can see they're kind of bulged out a little bit here. You also see that there's wispy fibers around it. It's arachnoid, just like there is in the brain. It's the same exact structures in a different area. So we cut those wispy arachnoids away, and then here are all of my nerve fibers right there. And underneath it, you start to see this abnormal structure bulging out, right? So then we actually go in and slide the nerve roots out of the way and lift that structure out. And that structure is a tumor. And it's a tumor coming from nerve roots. Now becomes the problem. I don't know if this is a motor nerve root or a sensory nerve root. If it's a motor nerve root and I cut it, guess what? The motor function will stop working. Somebody's knee may no longer flex, okay? So how can I figure this out? I actually put electrodes on the legs and I take a stimulator and I stimulate the nerve. And if the leg jumps, I know I've got a motor nerve. And if I do, I've got to take this and de-shell it and leave as much of the nerve intact as I can while I remove the bulk of this tumor. If it's a sensory nerve, snip, snip, I just take it right out. Somebody could live with a little bit of numbness by their knee rather than have the tumor grow. Does that make sense? So it's a really cool surgery because there's direct one-to-one -one anatomy to physiology that you see from the electricity. So we lucked out that this was a sensory nerve and I snipped it and cut it right out. And when you take that, there were a couple nerves that were pasted into the side of it that I needed to try and dissect away from. Um, but once I had it dissected, and it usually comes from only one root, you cut that out, you cut it open, it was cystic in nature, which we saw, and no pain. And that is a curative procedure for a very benign nerve sheet tumor called a schwannoma. Um, so again, I, I wanted to, we're somewhat right on time, I wanted to take the first half of the bit because there were so many comments on um, visualization of surgeries and just show you guys some different stuff of what we do. Any questions related to that before we kick into um, COVID? Yes, we have two questions. Um, so the first question is, uh, we were talking about like removing so many different tumors, like which one would you consider like the hardest to remove, like the pushing tumor or the spider web tumor? Yeah. Is there one that's really, really hard compared yeah. to the others? Yeah, so sadly it's a very easy answer. There's something called GBM, which is called glioblastoma multiformat. 
it is um, you can stage different aggressiveness of tumors, um, one being the least aggressive, four being the most aggressive, right? The most aggressive brain tumor, which is where the substance of the brain, it isn't the nerves, there's something called glia or the glue. It's the stuff that keeps the nerves healthy. It's the stuff that wraps around the nerves to make sure that they fire with good speed. The glia. The glia grows into a tumor. Every bit of the substance of the brain is the tumor. If you take a 70-year-old man, God forbid, even with, with COVID, all right, a 70-year-old with bad COPD, bad heart disease, other issues right there, and you take a 20-year-old kid with GBM, and sadly, no matter what I do, that kid is dead in a year. GBM is a prognosis no matter what I do. If I do 90% resection of the tumor and chemotherapy and radiation, it is only a rare few individual that I've been able to keep alive for 15 years or more. The vast majority die within a year's time frame of the diagnosis. That is one of the most important areas of, of cancer research for us as neurosurgeons of any kind. It is unfortunately a lethal cancer. And it's unfortunately also the most prevalent of the cancers that there are primary. The most prevalent is metastases to the brain from other areas of the body. But GBM is an area of research we need to really focus on. We've injected viruses into it. Uh, we, we, we continue to do all kinds of different things to try and slow this cancer down. Uh, could you say what GBM stands for again? Glioblastoma multiforman. But if you did a Google search for GBM neuro, you'd see the term and the technology. It's a glial-based tumor that's fairly aggressive. Why is it difficult? It's always further than where you see it to be further. Surgery is done by visual or tactile. By the time tissues become very abnormal that you can feel it, the cells are probably already abnormal way ahead of you. And unfortunately, this tumor divides at such a high rate, sometimes 30, 40%, which means thir one third of it might be already duplicating at any point in time, um, that we can't seem to get ahead of it with surgery, chemo, and radiation. Uh, we have another question um, involving tumors. If the tumor is deeper in the middle of the brain, will the long-term effects be worse or will the surgery be more difficult? You just ans asked one of the most important questions we as surgeons have to ask ourselves before we do any procedure at all. It comes back to my question about natural history. It comes back to what happens to that patient with that brainstem tumor if I don't do anything? And if, if they tell me they've felt like this for the past five years and nothing's gotten worse, I'm not jumping into their brainstem to do a surgery. If they tell me two weeks ago I was fine and now I can't use my hands, I don't know what's going on, and I see that something's growing dramatically before our eyes, the natural history is going to kill this person before my surgery. But that is very dependent on the type of tumor or what we see and all kinds of different factors. That's the question we should be asking ourselves before we do any type of intervention at all. Um, and then our final question is, um, are there any like type of surgeries where the patient's actually awake or conscious during it? Yes, because of the way the brain breaks up, and we're not really going to get into a lot of it this, this session. We may decide to build on it or have a second or do something else. The brain has a really interesting way of breaking up activity to different regions of the brain. I, I want to take two minutes, and Tom, I may have you co uh, comment. I do want to take two minutes on this principle because I think it's really important in general for all different facets. And that's um, trying to find a blank. Let's see. I'll start here. Um, it's called Fourier series and um, FF, FFTs. Some of you starting college may have seen it. The math majors may understand it. When you play a chord of music, you hit three notes, let's say. Each of the notes has a pitch and each of the notes has an amplitude or an intensity of how hard you hit it, okay? And whenever you play them, we're used to seeing music or if you ever watch an oscillator of music, music comes across as these waves, okay? There's a, and that, that's then in a amplitude and time. There's another way of looking at music and it's called looking at it um, from a Fourier transform or in a frequency space. And what the chord looks like in frequency space 
is this. There's three notes, call it a C, an E, and a G, each played with a certain level of intensity, but this might be middle C, the next octave up might be the C beyond that, the really low C would be here, the higher up there. And you can take a series of frequency space and actually make a very complex wave represented in a very simple fashion. And there's a lot of mathematics that can be done. There's a lot of easier interpretation and electrical signaling that can be done. But what Fourier said, which was unique, was that I can take any complex wave there is and make it a series of pure frequencies and put them together to make the complex form. The reason I'm taking all the time for this, that's kind of how the brain works. The brain takes these very complex overlaid time-based tasks and it puts the activity into different specific regions of the brain that combined make these complex activities. Language has a very focal center in it that responds to receptive language. It has a very focal center response to repetition, a very focal area that responds to expressive language. My point around that is these are regions, actually focal regions of the brain. It actually gets as explicit as that's how our hearing organ is built. It takes these waves and it actually breaks them down into frequency space in our ear. Covering too much, let me come back to your question. When I have a tumor in one of these really important regions, I wake somebody up. And when I'm operating on them in this region, I ask them questions. I make them answer things. I make them visually compose with language because that way as I'm resecting the tumor, I can ensure there isn't a problem in these regions. And I do it first by stimulating, shocking it with an electrical wave. If they stop talking when I stimulate a region, don't take the tumor out from there. Problem, if there's tumor there, the tumor may stop the language at some point, but it means I have to think of a different modality. Cutting is not gonna help them. Maybe radiation, maybe chemotherapy. Okay, thank you for the clarification. Yeah. Any other questions? Uh, no, not at this time. Tom, any thoughts before we jump into COVID? Any other context? So a, a, a couple of things. Um, one, one of them I want to follow on is, 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 is the very nice example you, you gave there and sort of these parallel functions across the brain. Uh, you know, and one of the thoughts that always sticks with me, and I apologize if I'm getting my neuroanatomy wrong it's been been a while uh but you know there, there's a part of the there's a very part of distinct part of the brain that will will interfere with your ability to to en to enunciate and you have broca's aphasia uh there is a completely separate area of the brain that will do the exact same thing for music and you have broca's a musica uh and it to to an outside observer to me you know, there's this very, very fine line between where you're speaking and where you're singing, but your brain has done such a meticulous job over time with evolution of, of, of equipping the, you know, in, in manufacturing, we call them focused factories, and these very specific skill sets around it. Uh, so I, I, I just think it's part of the, the miracle that is the brain. Uh, but the, the one thing I wanted to follow on and sort of be curious what your input is, is obviously these surgical techniques are masterful. You know, the, the, the stuff we're looking at here was inconceivable a, a, a generation ago. Uh, and I think you did an excellent job of, of, of talking about how people can learn things about shaking and whatnot. So I guess the question is, which is, more, which is a more difficult skill to develop? The ability to do the procedure or the judgment to decide when the procedure needs to be done? Yeah, I think you can't be a good doctor without either. And I think we both know examples of people that have one skill or the other skill. I think the reason that we work better in teams or groups is we ensure that if someone is a great technician, we need to help them with the decision making of the cases that they do. One thing the audience may not know, um, we as academic neurosurgeons, every one of our cases are reviewed by all of my peers. Everything that I do, my collective peers know about and watch. That's a really healthy thing. When my colleagues see Dr. Snyder have four or five complications of a similar procedure, guess who has a conversation right away? What's going on with this case? 
Why did these people not do well? Not having that friendly collegial look at your outcomes can really be scary sometimes if you were working independently and didn't have that. If you didn't have someone keeping an eye on how you were deciding and how your patients were turning out. So um, the answer to the question is it's a constant work of progress. None of them are easy or not easy. They both feed off of each other. And unfortunately, we learn from every one of our complications. The beauty of the type of collegiality we have is we want to make sure if I learn something that my colleague has learned it and hasn't made the same mistake. And that's how our group of 20 neurosurgeons practices. Not every group does that. There are people that won't share their cases and stay in isolation. Those aren't the type of people I'd refer my family members to. Um, it, it, sent, it's, a, it's a culture of excellence, though. I, hope. I sent the group a very important TED talk on, um, uh, on functional MRI. You can feed the, the body sugar with a little substance on it that shows up in an MRI machine. And you can perform a task under the MRI. And what happens in the MRI is parts of the brain light up. They're eating more sugar. They're active. And so if you ask someone in an MRI repeatedly, tap your finger, tap your finger, guess what you get a picture of in the brain? The area responsible for them tapping their finger. Okay? They did the coolest experiment. They had a teacher or tell a story while they were in the MRI. And then they had listeners sit in the MRI and do nothing but listen. And guess what happened? The same parts of the brain that the storyteller was lighting up as they were telling the story were lighting up in the listener. When we talk about how stories allow us to resonate, there is a reality to that. The visual imaging, the other things that come out in the story, we are actively doing it. When people say, I'm going to imagine myself practicing, there's a reality to that. There's, an, there's a neural network that's working as you're doing that. Um, that's important. And again, that's how we learned about all these regions we're talking about. How when someone speaks, we know where it is uniquely in them because that part of the brain lights up in a functional MRI. Um, with about 20 minutes, there's, and we have plenty of time to cover it, I wanna just carry on from some of the um, COVID conversation. The access that we had to our friend and partner in New York gave us some exquisite glimpses in the reality how fast this disease progressed for them. These orange dots are people, and they're people that had COVID. And every one of these orange dots at this date were people on a regular floor. They had no one that needed ICU care. Within three weeks, they had 300 COVID patients, all requiring intensive care unit care. Every one of the beds in the hospital got flipped to ICU. They were no longer even accepting the people that had mild symptoms that needed to come in. Their entire hospital became a critical care facility. Um, I have another, he was actually my co-fellow from Buffalo, uh, Jay Mako, who published a New England Journal paper on very strange things that he was seeing with stroke. First of all, he was seeing a lot of young people coming in from stroke. But what was odd was I had showed you guys last presentation how when we take out a chunk of clot, glorified plumbing, the pipe opens up and there's great flow to the brain. What Jay said was four out of four cases, I pulled out chunks of clot and the blood vessels clotted right off again before my eyes. I watched them re-clot and reform. I'd go up and take a clot out, they'd re-clot again. And that's very strange. That tells us something else is going on. Why on earth is the body clotting before our eyes? And then one of our colleagues from France who's been here in Buffalo and um, been part of our cases and seen our cases published a series of 10 cases, 10 in a row of really good perfusion studies and stroke cases, and not a single one of them opened up. All of them died. And again, it is very unusual for us. These things really put us on guard for something must be going on in the blood. What is it about these COVID patients that we can't open up their strokes the way we typically do? Dr. Tom Hughes brought up before how people were scared to come into the hospital. Big, big countries were noticing 40, 50% drops in, in people coming in for evaluations, even though emergency calls were hitting through the roof. 
Um, this just showed us that our stroke numbers were dropping significantly because people were scared to come into the hospital, okay? Here's another interesting thing. When people were getting COVID, they weren't just getting strokes in the brain. They were getting strokes throughout their body. 30% of the severely ill patients threw blood clots into their legs, into their heart, and had heart attacks. So realize the same process of a clot breaking down or blocking an artery occurs anywhere in the body and just causes different things. So what could this all mean? Why were young people having these persistent strokes or clots that were difficult? Why are there clots forming throughout the body? What could this mean about COVID? Around the same time we were seeing people were doing autopsies and finding clots everywhere. So how does coronavirus replicate? The virus is just a little soap bubble with sticky ends, the spike proteins, and inside of it is RNA. It's just like our DNA code, RNA is slightly different in terms of the, um, um, the structures that are used to build it by one sequence, but it's nothing but genetic code in a bubble. These proteins uniquely bind to what are called ACE2 receptors. These ACE2 receptors are not only in the lung, but they're throughout the endothelium. They're in all the blood vessels of our body. So the virus doesn't just infect the lung, it will infect all of the blood vessels, okay? When it binds, there's a protein that allows this to actually fuse with the lipid membrane of the cell. The minute the lipid membrane of the cell and the lipid membrane of the virus interact, the virus shoots its RNA into the cell itself. The cell itself has all these structures that are used to seeing RNA and translating it into proteins. So it doesn't know that that's a viral um, RNA. It's just any RNA that the cell puts out there, these ribosomes generate proteins. So it takes the viral and makes the viral proteins. One of the viral proteins makes more virus. Another one of the viral proteins takes the long proteins it makes and cuts them up into functional members that actually reassemble new virus and send the virus out to the cell membrane to, to then go throughout the body. This is how one virus becomes 1 million viral particles. It uses all of the RNA elements in the cell. What's also incredible is that it also sends a piece into the nucleus. The cell nucleus is used to seeing, or if it has a virus, it sends out these signals to the body and says, something's wrong, get over here and kill off this cell, there's a virus here. This unique coronavirus actually comes into the cell and shuts that process down as well. So it silences the cell's ability to scream that I'm in trouble and it replicates a ton of structures inside of itself. All of the different um, therapeutics are based on stopping each of these aspects. If you can do a protein that binds this so that it won't bind to the cell, you've stopped its ability to fuse. If you can stop the viral transcription from occurring, you've stopped its ability to make itself. If you can stop the virus's ability to come back out and package itself, that's, those are where the antiretrovirals work and that's how they work, okay? Tom, any comments there? Well, the one thing I would, I would, would call out um, is you, you're, you're looking at the science. Let's put it in the context that seven months ago, no one had ever heard of the coronavirus that there, there is a group of heroes out there, and Dr. Snyder's clear, clearly on this list, who despite the over, overwhelming pandemic, despite all the people be, filling up our hospitals, stopped and took time to do science, to, to do research, to publish and share uh, in just very, very short periods of time. Uh, and I, I, I think it's a, it's a tribute to the system that's been built and the dedication uh, that we, we're, not, we're not just reacting to what's happening in front of us, but we're proactively investigating, coming up with better ways of, 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 of identifying this disease, coming up better, better ways of taking care of patients. Uh, and, and that's going to mean at the end of the day, we're in a better position than we would be otherwise. One of the things that you've helped bring up and brought up before is how lucky we are that this is close to viruses that we've seen before. We learn so much from the original SARS virus that had a 30% mortality, okay? Why is this one so much more prevalent? When people got the original SARS, they were so sick, everyone knew, and they died, and they died relatively quickly. 
there wasn't massive spread. There weren't asymptomatic people spreading that virus around. That's why it was so contained. Okay. What makes this virus so scary is that the mutations or what are different in it is that you don't get that sick. And ironically, it's the people that aren't that sick that are spreading it all over the world. But with that original SARS, we learned its mechanism. Its mechanism was very similar to this. It's why Moderna and the other vaccine companies have such a jump start of where we are today, because they started working on it back when SARS hit. So we are very lucky that what we're seeing right now is a variant of what we've seen in the past as well. Um, interesting things about our immune response. When the virus comes in and infects this cell, again, what's interesting normally is that this cell tells the neighboring cells, hey, there's a virus here, slow down your production, don't let the virus pick up. The virus shuts that mechanism down. Okay. What should normally happen is, as I mentioned to you, that the virus fuses with the membrane to release itself. It actually leaves some of that, that um, protein behind. That's when the body says, something's wrong on the surface of this cell. This isn't me. There's abnormal stuff here. And that's when your immune response comes in, generates antibodies, kills off these cells that are making the viruses. Your body literally destroys the cells that make the virus to kill the virus. It doesn't allow it to replicate. That's how we kill this off. The reason people are left with lung scarring and injury is because of that, okay? But what's interesting is the body knows I've got a couple ways to kill this. I've got sharpshooters. If I had antibodies, I could direct my attack right to the virus itself. It also has these tanks and artilleries of T cells that are actually able to come in and blast regions of cells and areas while it's learning about the virus. Unfortunately, when there is an overload of virus, the body also goes, I don't have either of those options. And I like this term that I heard somebody talk about 11 years ago when they talk about SARS. They said, I go thermonuclear. I take my entire inflammatory arsenal and I send it in to kill the cells that have the virus. That's when all of the structures become leaky. That's when the lungs get filled with fluid because the normal cells don't have these junctions and interact well anymore. The body has gone thermonuclear to kill off the virus. And unfortunately, that's what people are dying from. Our goal is to have a healthy immune response that controls the virus that comes in. Yes, it does some damage to those cells, but it clears out the infection. Um, one thing that was very interesting, there was a publication of 6,000 patients in New York early on. And, and what happened was, first of all, a third of the people didn't have any fevers. What was also interesting was the general population in New York has about this number of people. So when they looked at the people that showed up with coronavirus in the hospital, they had a similar population to people that had asthma, lung disease, or obstructive sleep apnea. Now, when we thought about this as a lung disease, we said, all the people with lung disease are going to come in. They're going to all be dead. That's our biggest problem. Protect the people with chronic lung problems. But when we looked at who was actually showing up in the hospital with coronavirus, it was people that were obese. It was people with high blood pressure. These are not the people I'd expect to be dying from lung issues. What on earth is going on? And so as we looked at that, there was a very interesting reference paper, research paper on what obese, heart disease, cancer, and diabetes all have in common. And what it has in common is that oxygen goes crazy. When we are in these states of diabetes, heart disease, high blood pressure, our body's balance of how it deals with oxygen and turns it into water goes haywire. And we end up with things called oxygen radicals. And those oxygen radicals damage structures around them, damage DNA, damage others. When we are not eating healthy and caring for our bodies and are in states of having a massive obesity, what's happening is we've lost all of the redundancies to balance oxygen. And guess what? It just so happens the ACE2 receptor does in healthy cells. 
it is a critical link in balancing oxygen. And so when the virus kills those cells that have ACE2 receptors throughout the body, it's throwing this balance even more in this direction. And so who's dying from this are the people that don't have any oxygen balance capacity left over and the virus has taken the last straw and knocked that part off. When you lose that oxygen radical, what actually happens is the endothelium or the blood vessel gets damaged. When the blood vessel gets damaged, it releases a structure and that's what causes clots. What are helping us understand this? When we look at the lungs of individuals that have died from COVID, this is the airspace of their sponge, of their lung. It's wide open. It's not filled with fluid. The lungs work like a normal sponge. But what's happening at the interface is all the blood vessels are clotted off completely. And when the blood vessels are clotted off, all the oxygen can't get picked up into the blood vessels. And so somebody who normally should have a lot of oxygen in their body starts to lose their oxygen. Now, the other interesting thing is that when that happens and the exchange happens, people should back up their CO2. And CO2 is a signal for our brain that there's a problem if CO2 builds up. The issue with that is people are able to increase their respiratory rate and breathe off the CO2 in other areas. So their CO2 never really builds up to give us a problem. So these people show up in Dr. Hughes's office and their lips are blue and they're literally breathing at uh, you know, 30 times a minute instead of the six to eight that we normally do. That's when we know they're right on the brink. This virus may take them down. And those are the critical moments. Um, the conclusions that I've had from the COVID section, and we can then take a couple quick questions are critical. Masking is probably the most important factor we have to stopping this virus until a vaccine gets here. It's not necessarily the lung patients that are highest at risk. There's something about understanding that obesity, diabetes, and hypertension play a huge part in this. And that by doing all of the non-pharmaceutical measures that we've been doing, we are buying ourselves time. In that time, we're learning how to treat this disease better. We're learning more about it. We're buying ourselves time for that vaccine to get to herd immunity. And that's the current goal right now. That's the state of where we are right now with this. Continuing to learn about it. We're learning better treatments. Our mortality rates are dropping, but we need that win of a vaccine to likely really get ahead of this quickly. Tom, any comments? Yeah, no, I, I, I think you're absolutely right. Uh, and I was, I was thinking back actually to what you were talking about in terms of the, less, the lessons learned with, with SARS and MERS and, 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 and other disease states like that. And I, I think it's incredibly important to recognize that there are a group of people who clearly learned from that. The, uh, the, you know, the scientists learned, the research learned, and when, when this came, they'd already written the book, they could pull it off the shelf and start adding chapters to it the people who didn't seem to learn in a structural way are the policy people uh, mm -hmm. that there are a lot of lessons that came out of the, the pandemic of 1918 that came out of SARS came out of mirrors in terms of how you protect a society around this and it, there, there's no evidence that that there was a significant learning curve around any of that so I think as, as a conversation going forward yes we need to get better we need to get better at healthcare. we need to get better at science but we're beyond the point where we can simply think of healthcare as one physician treating one patient. We need to act as a society. We need to think about how we're going to address something like this globally. Uh, you know, I, I, I am struck by the fact that this virus didn't exist six months ago, and, and it has reshaped the entire world. Uh, we, we need to be prepared collectively to, to, to offer societal response, or we're going to keep coming back to scenarios where we're relying on the scientists, we're relying on doctors like Dr. Snyder to, to, uh, to, to rush into the breach and find us solutions. Well said. And if anyone is going to lead us in that charge and ask those questions, just like you have the whole way from the beginning of this, it's that bigger picture. It's how do we get better and learn from this? How do we prevent the next one? It may not have a 1% mortality, but has a 40% mortality and maybe doesn't spread what we think is fast like this. No, the measles spreads fast. Imagine it truly is a small particulate spread that stays in the air for 30 minutes and anyone can get it and it's lethal. 
questions you're asking are gonna help us prepare and catch and, and protect ourselves for those moments. And again, if you play the numbers, it will happen. It's a matter of time, which is why so many people were prescient and predicting that this would occur at some point. Sarah, any, any final questions or comments from the group? And again, if there are, we'll, I know Dr. Hughes has been what is wonderful. We'll take any questions as well offline and help follow up with anybody if they have them. Mm -hmm. yeah, we, have a, we have a few different questions. Um, there's a question about like the relationship between COVID-19 and stroke. Um, if you have like a more serious case of COVID-19, are you at a higher risk for stroke or how does that relationship really work? In? So I, I, the way I think about it is I come back to that one slide that showed one third of the people with severe COVID had clots throughout their body. Right. And so if one third of the people that have COVID severely are showing big clots, these aren't micro clots. These are people that have giant clots in major arteries of their blood vessels. We know that they've got to be related somehow. OK. And again, my thought process on it is that they're related because the etiology of how the virus works works by shutting down the small blood vessels. And that then can propagate to give us further problems. Um, it's also related to the immune response that the body puts out to fight this virus. Um, so they're, they're related to one another. The answer to that is, believe it or not, one of the most forefront treatments of this is blood thinners early on. And we even treat people for three months now sometimes after they've cleared the virus to protect them from the clotting problems that could happen with this virus. Uh, we also have a question regarding the vaccine. Um, is the idea of the vaccine is it's you were talking earlier about like the cells are not being able to cry for help anymore. Is the vaccine supposed to be kind of be helping with that particular part of this problem? So if we had antibodies and think of them like the sharpshooters, the antibodies could be circulating in the body so that when they see the elements of the spike protein that are on the infective virus, the antibodies can form a link so that those can no longer bind with the cells, or when they see the messengers of those spikes on cells, they can selectively kill those off so that the virus can't use its machinery to replicate. It's got two ways that it works. It stops the binding and it kills off any cells that have seen it. When you don't have that response ready, it takes time to build it. It can take two, three weeks for your body to learn how to develop that response. During that two, three weeks, the virus runs rampant. And that's why people can get so sick. So when you have antibodies, it's a way of speeding up. It's amplifying your body's immune response, hyper-focused on what it needs to kill off. And again, that's how vaccines work. Um, and so... Um, again, offline, we could talk about the uniqueness of Moderna's vaccine to, compared to others, but in any of the vaccines that we're developing, what you're doing is you're trying to get the body to generate an immune response so that it's ready to attack when it needs to. So here's a simple example. They infect chickens with the virus, chicken eggs. They then kill off the chicken egg at some point, which now has millions and millions and millions of active viruses within them. They kill all the viruses so the viruses are dead. They then inject that virus into the body, dead, so it can't infect somebody. The immune response looks at the dead virus and learns how to attack it. It learns how to build immune, uh, immune response. It's safe because the virus is dead and can't interact. But that's how the body builds its antibodies, so that if it ever sees the live virus, it's ready to go. And that's the classic method of what we call an inactivated vaccine. It's basically a dead virus that you're training, then your body's learning how to kill. Um, would you be able to offer a little more clarification on the relationship between obesity and SARS? Yeah, the, it, it's a complex cascade of what we call redox reduction potentials. There are enzymes superoxide dismutase, glutathione reductase, doesn't matter. There are tools that your body has in place that it uses to capture any of these oxygen species that are acting irregularly or highly reactive. When you are morbidly obese, 
you do not have optimal function of those enzymes. And so that very reactive oxygen is allowed to bounce around in the body and damage, cause all kinds of damage to all kinds of tissue structures. We know that that's present in the morbidly obese individuals. Um, and then we've just also had a lot of general questions about like careers and medicine and things like that. Are these questions that could be brought to you offline? Please, and Dr. Tom Hughes is exceptional as a mentor for that as well. I think collectively, um, you know, some of the questions that came through before, it doesn't matter where your passion is. There is no, you've got to do this and take this course and get here to get there. Really get rid of that mentality. That doesn't mean that you don't need organic chemistry, right? There's core courses you have to take. And as long as your guidance counselors know, you know, tell, you're on that right path, don't think there's anything else anybody looks for. Let the other parts outside that core be filled with your passions. I guarantee you, if you're passionate about it, it will feed back to whatever you end up doing in the right way. So don't worry about what course do I have to take to get in. Cover the core courses and let your passion drive everything else. Um, thank you so much uh, for being a host uh, for this webinar series. The attendees have enjoyed this immensely. It's been such a great experience. Uh, thank you, Dr. Hughes, for joining us as well and offering your expertise on all these topics. Um, just a reminder that at the conclusion of this webinar, the SurveyMonkey link will appear. If the attendees could fill out the SurveyMonkey to kind of give us more feedback in order to improve like future webinars as well. Um, but thank you so much, Dr. Snyder and Dr. Hughes um, for lending us your expertise today. Dr. Tom Hughes and I look forward to meeting each of you at the JI at some point in the future. Um, I'd love to see you guys doing some hands-on testing on the machines and the flow models. Um, and uh, again, Tom, thank you for joining me at an incredible, um, you, you take the, the webinar to a whole nother level having you on it. So I appreciate you. No, Ken, I appreciate it. I, I, I learned stuff just being here. Have a great day, everybody. Thanks for taking the time. Thank Josh, you all. Annette, thank you guys. Thank you. Have a nice night.